Thank you so much for the introduction, Andy. Really appreciate it. And thank you all for joining us, 34 of us uh, today, talking about how to make effective use of infographics. Um, so as Andy mentioned, I do have a presentation. I just wanted to spend just a few seconds to interact with you face to face as much as we can in this setting. I would have loved to be there in person to be able to deliver this talk, but alas, here we are. So uh, thank you. And uh, I will now start my presentation and share that with you. So today we're talking about how to make effective use of infographics. As Andy said, it's going to be an informal session. I've prepared a short presentation where I walk you through some examples, um, discussion around how to engage with different audiences uh, and what is the process? What is the process that we go through when we create these research-based infographics? And I'll have, we'll have the opportunity for you to ask as many questions as you want and for, uh, for you to be able to see how this would apply to your own work. So I think we can all agree we're here today and we can all agree on the fact that brilliant research can change the world for the better. But the problem is that sometimes decision makers don't have the time or the expertise to engage with those findings and to see how it specifically applies to them for them to be able to make a decision based on that research. And so this is the exact need, direct need for why uh, Research We're Told exists. This is a company that I started over three years ago, um, born out of this need to help researchers communicate their findings in accessible and visual ways through a variety of uh, formats, um, from infographics, which we'll talk about today, to policy briefs, visual summaries, uh, and I'll show you more of those today. And really the purpose of these documents and the purpose of you know, why we wake up every morning and do what we do and, and run this company, uh, despite um, uh, all other challenges, are wanting to, to help researchers make a difference. And we, we believe on the potential that research has to do that, and we want to help researchers um, with their goals um, in this way. Oh, I'm a bit nervous. I didn't realize I was going to be this nervous. On the, I thought it was going to be a very informal session, but uh, there we go. It, it happens even virtually. So I'm showing you now on the screen a range of uh, organizations that we've worked. So as Andy said, we, we started um, by working primarily with universities and academic researchers, but we have seen this need um, apply to other organizations from public sector organizations, government departments, NGOs and charities all um, have in common the need to communicate what they're doing to the world to those who are not in their field, so those who don't have that specific expertise. So we are the approved supplier of 14 UK universities, obviously University of Birmingham being one of them, and we've had experience as well working with um, other organisations. So at the very core of what we do, um, we take complex research, often presented in this format that I'm sure you're all very familiar with, academic journals, and turn that into um, more visual, more accessible documents, uh, usually shorter documents that um, researchers can use in their pathways to impact. So we always say that creating these documents doesn't secure or guarantee impact, but it is certainly a pathway to impact and it can help you start those conversations with non-academics in a way that will hopefully kickstart action and uh, decisions in the real world. So today I want to talk about these three different, we'll, we'll structure the 15 minutes we've got in, in these three sections. So how do we engage with different audiences? And I don't know exactly what your goals are in terms of research communication, but hopefully this very short section here, which we uh, deliver in all of our workshops will give you at least some ideas or make you think of, you know, if I want to engage with businesses, general public, media, policymakers, what are some key aspects for me to think about? So hopefully that will uh, be very valuable to you. Then I'll um, share some case studies of projects we've done and also talk about the actual process that we go through to create an infographic. Brilliant. So let's start talking about uh, different audiences. So we know that, um, well, uh, in uh, the projects that we've done so far, the most important aspect for us to think about whenever we start a collaboration is the aim. So why we're doing what we're doing, what is the purpose of creating a shorter format? And who are we talking to? And these two aspects then um, dictate everything else that we do with that particular collaboration. This informs everything that we do and we reverse engineer from these goals and from these audience needs to into the products that we create and that we develop. So I'll cover a few audiences for us. I'll start by talking about the general public and um, the most important questions that you might want to think about if your research 
applies to the general public or has implications um, for, for a general audience, what questions do you have to keep in mind when you're engaging with this specific audience? So the first one would be, and arguably this probably goes with all the audiences we'll be talking about, well, why should people care and how does this relate to their life and what is the story you're trying to tell? So really trying to make that effort to take your research to the very human day-to-day -day level um, as possible. Now, when engaging with the public, public, you want to keep your information as accessible as possible, using metaphors to describe complex concepts um, and um, simplifying the text as much as possible. So I'll give you an example. We've worked with academics at the University of Sheffield on the concept of social prescribing, which is um, referred to often to talk about this process when health professionals refer patients to support in the community. And um, this concept can be hard to explain if you don't understand how the NHS works. And it's typically illustrated in a diagram like I'm showing you here on the screen used by NHS England. But researchers at the University of Sheffield who we've collaborated with um, in partnership with Voluntary Action Sheffield knew that in order for this type of concept, for this concept to reach people, to reach the general public, they needed to communicate it differently. So instead of a diagram, we produced uh, an illustration in a comic book format. So the struggle to fix a problem in people's health and well-being is being illustrated here by the metaphor of uh, a mountain that's hard to climb and the, with the help of a local health worker giving them support and guidance. So this comic is much more, much more an appropriate format to much more of an appropriate format to communicate with the public. Now, I'm not saying that if you want to communicate with the public, you should only do comics. I'm giving you an example of, you know, a different format that you might have perhaps not considered. Um, and if your particular, if your research has a story you want to tell them, perhaps this format would work well for you. And the way we communicate with the public closely aligns with how we communicate with the media. So uh, probably uh, some of you have at least heard about the conversation. Um, and so I've been in touch with one of the commissioning editors there and Ask, the, ask her, you know, what is she looking for in the articles that researchers write for the conversation? What's, what are some of the principles that she's keeping in mind when she reads the, the article? So she says, think about how you'd explain your research to a friend, family member, or even someone at the pub. Your work needs to feel accessible to a general audience. And think about that story you want to tell and what you can relate that to that will help people understand your work. When talking about the public sector and policymakers, um, I think, one of the biggest um, assumption, you know, biggest mistakes people make is to assume that policymakers will automatically know the jargon and the, you know, all of the terminology involved with the research, and that's not usually the case. And so here, I want to give you the take of fellow researcher from Cardiff Medical School that urges researchers to keep findings brief and concise. Moreover, when when talking to policymakers, you want to show them that you understand what that policy process involves and that the recommendations that you're making to them are realistic and actionable and that they, um, they can easily see how that relates to their uh, remit. And so here I want to show you an example of a series of visual summaries we produced for well, what used to be the DFID, uh, Department for International Development. They um, have a lot of aid programs. And at the end of these aid programs, they produce huge, huge reports that um, they typically publish, but they realize that not many people would read those reports. So together we collaborated on producing a four page visual summary um, with the key findings, the key problem solution and learning uh, from those reports into this series of documents. So showing you this, this example should give you confidence to present your findings in visual ways to those who work in policy. Okay. In terms of the private sector, here I want to share with you the insights from the business development manager at Warwick University with whom we've collaborated and his number one tip when, coming, when engaging with businesses to keep it simple, simple, if you want to maximize your appeal. And to keep in mind that more detailed analysis can always be used as a follow-up once businesses have expressed an initial interest. So as an example, the University of Warwick um, um, have developed in collaboration with us a series of policy briefs on the impacts of Brexit uh, on uh, local businesses in the area. And they have produced these, these briefs, which uh, Tony in his role uses to engage with businesses and connect researchers with businesses. So um, 
they would send a document like this and prep the business, show the, the business what specific legal implications apply to them and start that dialogue in how the researchers can support them with any legal changes that could take place. And then finally, I want to talk to you about the third sector and share with you the insights of the Mel manager at Fairtrade International, a uh, huge, huge NGO that we work with, um, and to show that even they, you know, absolutely adopt this transformation of very text heavy reports into sharp and easy to understand visuals for both internal and external communication. And this is uh, an example of a two page infographic that we produced for them to pull out the key findings from a monitoring impact report they had. So I hope you're all still with me. I can't see your faces, but I hope that you're still there and are feeling engaged with what I've showed you so far. I want to take a few minutes uh, now to show you some, show you some case studies that uh, we produced for researchers. So I'm going to share a different part of my screen now. So I've selected, um, if you can say yes in the chat, if you can see my screen, that would be very helpful to get some feedback from you. Let's see. Yes, thank you, Karis. Thank you, Angela. Brilliant. So what you're seeing on the screen now is a two page infographic that we produced for uh, researchers at the University of Sheffield on this issue of uh, music helping people with sleeping problems. Uh, and so um, this is based on a huge spreadsheet with survey results. This was, a, this was the largest survey, um, music sleep survey launch, launched in the UK. And they had a huge amount of data and they wanted to um, uh, show in a two page infographic at the bottom, what the problem is, why music is the solution, who do they uh, survey, what kind of genres and artists came up as being the uh, top ones in the answers and why uh, use music and then at the end some next steps or so very bold and big call to action they wanted more people to get involved and take the survey and of course at the end as you'll see with all the examples i'll show you it's a very clear institutional affiliation any sort of funder acknowledgement anything like that to really distinguish these materials from any sort of marketing material you might be receiving um, anywhere else this is has a very clear institutional affiliation. Um, similarly, that same researcher came to us a year later on a similar topic uh, related to music, but talking about classical music reviews. So again, surveyed 1200 people on their preferences in terms of classical music, the way they listen to, as you can see, some very niche topics and all of them are very broad. Um, but how to show this data, how to pull out those key findings from the data and um, visualize them in an easy to see way. So here we have, again, just a two page document um, showing the key results from their survey. Um, this specific infographic was also created in German because the research partners, as you can see at the bottom of the page, um, were also from Switzerland. And so something to think about if your research is um, in other countries or perhaps think of how you can translate it in a different country to uh, language to increase the impact it can make and the uh, accessibility for more audiences. Um, this is again showing you the monitoring our impact report from Fairtrade International. So um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of data that they collected, but uh, throughout what, through the process of working with us, they identify what were the five key messages they wanted to pull out, the five key headings uh, out of that huge report uh, and produce something that's much more easy to share and much more easy to digest in terms of their results. This is a policy brief, so just a different format, but a policy brief on a concept of performance based financing for health in low and middle income countries. Policy briefs are more formal uh, in the way they're presented and um, usually less quantitative in terms of the information that they have on them. But here, um, this is a four page policy brief that really looks at the challenges and, and opportunities with this particular concept. And this is something that's um, that was presented by our a client to health ministers working in this field to help them make a decision about whether to adopt this concept or not. And then finally, I want to show you another one from um, researchers at the University of Sheffield on reducing harm from alcohol on the topic of minimum unit, minimum unit pricing. So again, a lot of data and information, but together we identify the four key findings that they wanted to get across to clinical commissioning groups in health. 
And then finally here, we've got uh, the topic of discolored drinking water and why this is an issue for companies who help. Uh, uh, yeah, why this is an issue for companies and how uh, the particular solution designed here by researchers at Sheffield uh, helps um, and how companies here in the, in the bottom section, how they can get in touch to, to reach out to the experts. Okay. And so finally, just for a few more minutes, what is the process that we go through? What is, um, what are the four steps that we go through? And so really briefly, the first step that is really the most important, and I wanna emphasize here the word process, uh, and I bolded it to emphasize it because I don't want you to think that you send us the research and then it goes through a black hole and then it comes out looking designed like that. <laughs> There's a whole process that goes through and it is actually a process that researchers find that add, adds value to their own skills and to their own way of looking at their research. It gives them a fresh perspective and it helps them think about their research in completely new ways um, through our, throughout our collaboration. So the first process, the first step is a client call. So this is an in-depth client call where we really cover everything and anything about the audience, what are our goals, uh, what's the format we're looking to, what's most appropriate for our audience, how long, what structure should we have, what key messages. Um, in terms of the design, we talk about any guidelines, um, any color palette considerations, any logos. So really touching on all of these things and helping you through talking about your audience, helping you think, okay, what is it about my research that I really need to ex extract from that uh, report? And so at the end of this call, what you should have is, um, you know, notes about these points that will help you when you create a structured Word document of text, what we would call, say, a script of these um, at this document. So everything you've seen that I've just shown you now, if you can imagine it in a Word document, black and white, that is the script that we would receive from the client based on our initial client call. Then we go through that editing stage where one of our research communicators edits the text based on those client call details. We send you the text back for client feedback and then you've got one to two opportunities here to refine the text. And it is this process of refining the information that gets you closer to what you think the actual message is. Uh, and that's where you see that fresh perspective. Then we go into the design stage where one of our designers brings the text to life based on the details. Um, creates appropriate illustrations. Uh, we send the document back to you. There's some opportunities for feedback there. Again, further refining it. And then finally, we deliver the project for you. Um, there's accessible PDFs are available and there's versatile formats available for dissemination for social media. I, I, we don't have time to go through that, but from that PDF, you would um, we, we do give you the option to create more uh, formats for your dissemination. And we can always have a follow-up conversation with you about this dissemination strategy if you'd find it helpful. So at this point, I want to uh, give the virtual microphone to Andy because it's not usual that we have the chance to hear from someone who's actually gone through this process um, and talk just a little bit about you know, this three-year study we've done together. And at the end of each year, we produced a four-page infographic based on the results. So Andy, anything you can uh, share that would be helpful right now. Thanks, Mahaina. Um, this, is, this has been a really interesting process for us. I mean, I, 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 I don't have a background in doing anything other than writing academic text. As most academics, we're not really taught um, effective ways of communicating large volumes of research data. We stand in front of students and do a job of, of, of slicing up information and structuring it for them to give them bite-sized chunks of information. But, but almost all the research interactions that I had engaged with before I started this project have been about trying to absorb large amounts of text um, and expecting our readers to be able to wade through large amounts of text and often complex ideas and concepts and, 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 and principles um, and, and data in large tables with stars on them, that very small text at the bottom that explain what things mean. Um, and when we approached this particular project, which was a project working with um, two clients um, uh, that were uh, um, registered social landlords, um, I happen to be based in, 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 in Devon, near, in Exeter. They were really keen for us to, to be thinking not only how we provide information that will provide depth and rigor and all those sorts of things that they wanted out of an academic research project, but also 
information that would be accessible to a wide range of audience, particularly ones that could look quickly at the key messages, the key stories that were coming out and be able to absorb that information to determine where it is that it would be appropriate for them to dig in deeper, be they the, 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 um, the people who are setting policy in this field or, or, or those in, 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 the, in the case of one of our clients who were um, a, a district council, their councillors or board members in the, in the case of the other. Um, to, to, to engage with this. So they wanted complex information from, from uh, large uh, surveys that we were doing across their client base, but they wanted to have layers to that information, uh, mechanisms to be able to get overviews as well as provide the detail. Um, and so I'll be honest, I wasn't really sure how to do that uh, effectively. And so we worked with Mahela's team to actually think about what was the right way of taking the information that we had to design something that would be visually appealing and engaging rather than table after table of information and text, which, um, which was difficult to absorb and information that would enable somebody to be able to, to um, uh, glean uh, uh, data very quickly um, as, as, as they needed, particularly if you were in a board meeting type uh, uh, context where it was just not appropriate to expect people to read multiple pages of data uh, in advance. They, 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 they wanted to be able to access this quickly and determine where they should be focusing their limited time for, for strategic development. So text absolutely wasn't right. Um, and as Mahana said, this very much was a process. We had created uh, data sets in the usual way um, that we would as academics. And so we started to share that information with Mahela. We went through a process of um, thinking about, well, what, what really are the highlights? And it was, it, not only did it enable us to produce uh, infographics that were, uh, that were um, uh, valuable for our, for our clients, but actually it was also hugely helpful for us to be able to see the wood for the trees in, the, in, the, in, in our process. So what were the real stories that were coming out of this data? What were the real um, messages that were important for the audience and for us to be able to communicate? So that process was absolutely critical of going through sort of two or three stages of defining down something that would be visually appealing, but also would highlight the relevant information. Um, and, and also, as, as you'll see there, by just having a look at the way that appeals, actually, the, Presenting the information visually, you can use the, the page to actually think about telling a story even before you actually get into the detail. So look, it, you, you don't even need to have a look at any of this information, probably to be able to guess that we're talking something here around housing, something around people's homes, something about the context um, in, in which housing is developed because it's splashed across the top of the page. But you're already beginning to, to use the visual to present before you've even got to the data. And that great example of that, that water um, that yeah. we showed to us a few moments ago with the pipes. Yeah, you're already saying this is, this is going to be something about something to do with water and the feeds of water. So you can begin to set context to information in a way that makes that information more engaging. Yeah. Um, and this was this was really well received. The first year was a bit of an experiment. We weren't sure how it was going to work. But what we got back from, from our clients was that they, they this this was they, they, they thought it was tremendous. They really appreciated the effort that had been taken and the time that had been taken to think about uh, how we presented this. Um, and and and, uh, and over the three years, we were able to sort of enhance the way we did this and and um, uh, uh, and produce accessible versions of these as PDF yeah. documents. So they weren't just static for print documents, but also could be used by the a breadth of audiences um, for whom different mechanisms of absorbing information were, were critical to be able to get that information out. So just, just a, a, um, some experiences of, of, of why we work this way and why we will very much continue to be thinking like this in the way in which we, we produce our future projects. Thank you so much. I hope that was helpful for you. Um, and that we'll be opening up to questions. There's some questions coming in the chat, which I will uh, mention in a second. If you've got any questions, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, one last thing to say is that our this process that I was talking to you about in terms of the step-by-step, -step, the questions that we go through and considerations for all of the stages is something that I've articulated after over a hundred collaborations um, in this guide to communicating research beyond academia, which is, um, available for purchase on our website, but also today um, I've 
fetched this with Andy before and talked to him, but I'd like to offer three um, of these guides to three of you today. So my colleague uh, Gemma is putting together a list of those of you who've joined us today. Thank you very much. And we will um, do a raffle either at the end of the call or after the call just to um, offer uh, a copy of this guide. So that's my uh, end of the presentation. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and then you can see me. I'll be looking in the chat to um, answer any questions uh, that you might have. So is there any software or website you can recommend for creating infographics from data? Um, absolutely. So it kind of depends on how, well, first of all, how familiar you are with and how much time you have to start learning a new software from scratch. So I would say at the very sort of user-friendly software that anyone can make a free account on and start playing around with information on a page and uh, ways to represent data would be Canva, which is canva.com. See if I can type that in the um, chat. So canva.com is marketed as graphic design made simple. It is a software that actually you can uh, see the beauty of us being able to Second Canva, there you go. Um, so Haib also uh, likes it. So the beauty of us being able to do this virtually is that I can actually show it to you. So this is what Canva looks like. I guess, as I said, free account, anyone can, can start. And what I like here is on the right-hand side, you've got create a design and you can put your custom dimensions. But if you click A4 document, which is what I've kind of been showing you in terms of format, um, they've got a variety of templates here that you can choose from. Um, let's just say if we put report, um, you can go through these, these are all free to use and i'm not saying you just use this as it is and it'll be perfect for your needs but it's a starting point so you don't start from a blank uh, canvas um if you are looking to create infographics and i appreciate that you know there will be a nuance of data that um and my infographic um this could just give you some um, ideas in terms of how to present information any um icons to use any ways in which the information are presented on the screen. And there is um, within the elements that you can use various charts where you can actually input specific data that you have and those visuals will pop up on the screen. Okay, so that is what we have in terms of kind of user-friendly, um, easy to use straight away. In terms of um, Tableau being the, you know, what is regarded as the data visualization software um, for those who have huge amounts of data. You are in a very lucky position to be able to use it for free um, because you are part of a university, um, those of you who are. So Tableau would be obviously a much steeper learning curve, but this is where, you know, um, you could really get a lot out of showing your data intuitively, interactively, um, and all of that stuff. So. I hey, you know, could, could add actually, even if you're not part of a university, they oh, have you a can. community in Tableau called Tableau Public, which actually there enables you to use the, the full tool. Um, yeah. The only difference is you can't save the tool, the what, what, what you produce um, for just use by yourself. You have to right. put it into a sort of public, um, a, a public uh, a, a, um, tool, uh, con, uh, for everybody to be able to see. But you, but you, but there is a, a thing called Tableau Public that you can make there use of, and there's also an enormous community. Yeah. of people who you can ask advice for about how to use this sort of stuff um, it's it works particularly well i think doesn't it with um with with excel type data sets yes. that you can bring in and and revisualize but, but yeah absolutely endorse tableau as a, as, a, as a really great tool yeah absolutely so as you can see here you've got tableau uh, public so something to consider and, and think about in terms of resources available to you let's see what else um Martin, uh, what methods do you use to, de to determine the success of an infographic and what time period do you consider is sufficient to make that determination after publication? Yeah, this is always an interesting question around, if you will, the impact of these tools in engaging with the audience. And there is no kind of analytic, you know, dashboard that we can put this in and see, uh, have we achieved our goals? Really, I think it comes down to the relationship that you have with your audience and how you disseminate that material to them. So, uh, you know, in the example with Andy around those dissemination seminars and meetings that they had where they presented these infographics and the, that live feedback that they got from their audience, whether it was successful or not, whether it, it achieved its goals or not. So we kind of go full circle from what is the aim of the collaboration to begin with. And that's where you have to be really clear on the kinds of things you're looking to achieve 
whether it's you know just a learning opportunity you want to disseminate it with certain people whether it's more about raising awareness and how would you measure that um so whatever that or influencing a policy process and then the dissemination strategy that is aligned with that so i wouldn't say there's like a one side one answer fits all it really depends on what your aim is with producing this and what you're looking to achieve that would determine the success of, um, of the collaboration. Um, yeah, someone's saying, Robert, uh, Power BI, as well as Tableau, it's a Microsoft tool that integrates with a lot of uh, data sources. Um, and James says, I found them really good when talking to research participants at the end of the projects. Yeah, so the tool. So that's it, you know, if, if, um, if as part of your aim is to engage with research participants, perhaps you have a target in mind of how many or the kinds of conversations you want to have that could kind of feed into your aim for producing these. Uh, we've got so Sophie and uh, Sophie also a seconding Canva. Um, so it's good to know that you, some of you are already familiar with these and others can learn as well. Do any of you have any other questions that you wanted to share with me? Whilst I wait, I'm going to prepare the raffle, <laughs> which is um, always an exciting. Okay. Um, if any questions pop up after the session and you want to get in touch with me, you can always um, email me. You've got my email address here. It's Mihaila at researchretold.com. You can follow us on Twitter and on LinkedIn and stay in touch with what we do. We've got a newsletter where we can. Um, share events that we do, any particular resources, um, blogs on our blogs as a series of kind of skills we're always aimed at helping researchers and their communication. So um, I'd really um, love to see you be part of our community. And um, let's see if there's any other questions. Yeah, yeah. Give, give, give people an idea about the sort of length of time mm. this sort of process and, 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 and what sort of stage is it helpful for you to actually start to engage with researchers? over this should they be sure. should, should they be engaging with you at the beginning of their work or do they wait until the research results are actually available for you to engage what works best do you think mm -hmm. that's a great question because um a lot of researchers think of dissemination and communication as um kind of an afterthought when it comes to the project so really uh, taking the time to think about this you know, the ideal scenario is when you're actually putting in the application uh, for the research grant, if you can put in a paragraph in there, a blurb about your pathway to impact um, or any <laughs> request. And um, that would make sure that you have ring fenced some budget already for the communication work, which we'll go on to in a second. Someone has uh, a question about budget. Um, so at the very beginning, you can include working with research retold as a just a one paragraph in there. And that will show, you know, research retold and other organizations, but that will show the funder that you've taken the time to think about your communication strategy and you're not just you know, uh, thinking about this at the end. Uh, however, having said that, not all researchers have um, that foresight to do it in the beginning. And so they'll come to us at the end of the research project where there's usually an underspend and they'll say, you know, can we, what can we produce um, to be able to engage with these audiences? So we've had instances of even before the research has started or at the end, once the findings have, um, have come out and researchers are more clear in terms of what they want to communicate. In terms of timelines, I would say a minimum of three to four weeks. As you saw, it's quite um, a lengthy process because there is a lot of refinement there in terms of the messages that we go through and um, the text and the design. So we wanna make sure we get it right. Um, so it's not necessarily, we, we do work with very tight deadlines sometimes, I'm sure Andy can attest to, and we, we do offer a quick turnaround as, as fast as we can, but there's just only so much that you can um, hurry up uh, and still have a high quality product. Um, how much does it roughly cost to produce a four page document? I'm thinking of planning for research budget. Yes, absolutely. So based on what you've seen, um, the starting price for a four page document like the one you've seen would be £1,600 plus VAT. And um, as I said, if you want to plan for research budgets on our website, actually, we do have under services like a blurb that you can copy and paste from the website and just input it in your um, application just to give a bit more substance to the application. Um, 
what if your research is more qualitative and have less quantitative data? How do you interpret that to infographics? Yeah, that's a great question, Mohammad. And a lot of our researchers are actually social scientists and um, a lot of their research is um, qualitative in the sense of interview findings and all that stuff. So we have, let me see if I can just, again, trying to use the beauty of being online so I can show you some examples. Uh, but usually um, really the process that we go through is to think of that visual metaphor that would hold the text in. So I'm going to give you an example now of a research project we did around, um, around um, how the UK designates national treasures. So a very niche topic, but one that, um, let's see if I can share my screen now. It's the perfect example of, there was absolutely no number in that research apart from the year um, the research was conducted in. So um, what you're looking at here is a four page uh, policy brief that was only sent to six policymakers that the researcher had identified as being key to her uh, research. So it might be that the people you need to influence are a handful of people. So you need to, you can be quite targeted in your dissemination. So the researcher here is talking about addressing ethical provenance when design, designated UK national treasures and um, what we have here and what we've created for her is a four page visual document that uses the metaphor of the museum to hold the text and to show the timeline of objects acquired during colonial times, objects of importance to other countries after 1970 and what will happen after 2020. And so here on the painting, I suppose, on the wall, we have the, the most important case study in this particular field that uh, generated and set in motion a whole host of other policies about this particular uh, field. And then on the back, the recommendations, which were very clear for this particular committee in government. And then at the end, of course, contact and um, institutional affiliation. So to give you confidence that these visual documents aren't, we have infographics in the title of the talk, so I wanted to show you that, but um, we have worked with a range of qualitative and quantitative research. And there's always there's always a nicer, more visual way to present research, absolutely. Okay, let's see if anyone else has any questions. Okay, so. J James was asking a question, Mahalo, about what, oh. what, what, should, what should we do to make ourselves clearer to you? What's, a, what, what's an ideal brief? Um, uh, we talked about mm. when you might want to engage, but what sort of information do you, do you actually need? What makes your lives easier or harder? Yes, that is such a good question. Hold on, I will actually show you in action. Um, can, can I just very quickly rephrase as do's and don'ts from, from us? You know, you yes. must have a... Yeah, what, what information you would want to, I would want ideally to, to receive. Um, okay, so I will, yeah, so, um, just trying to think of um, a particular project that would work. But I think in terms of, you know, the things I've, I've kind of shared in the, um, in the presentation around, let's go back to that slide. Um, these are all the things we'd be covering in that initial call, right? So anything you can share with us around, you know, first of all, a very short sentence about what is the project? You know, what is it aiming to do? Who are you talking to? Who's your main audience? What are you hoping to achieve ultimately? Um, and then uh, I think just in terms of that, uh, that would be extremely helpful to have an understanding about, you know, what the project is and the key messages, what are some rough audiences you're thinking of engaging with and what are you looking um, for us to help you produce? Now, obviously within that initial discovery call um, before this one, when we actually get to know each other uh, and start working relationship, we will help you get to those answers, but being clear around these things is always helpful. Um, having an idea of um, what budget you're willing to spend on this and what timelines are involved is always very helpful. I don't know, in terms of don'ts, um, 
<laughs> I don't know. I, I say here a question, what's a request that has flummoxed you? <laughs> I think, you know, unrealistic timelines and budgets or expectations of the work being done, uh, you know, without input from you or without feedback from you for it to be done very quickly um, and very cheaply. It's just, you know, not the kind of service that you'll be, you'll be receiving. And if you're willing to start a long-term collaboration and to get a partner that actually understands your research and works closely with you, then we're the team for you. Can I, can I add um, something to that, Mahela? Yeah. I think one of the things that actually made our project, I think, um, not, not only more successful, but actually more enjoyable, was also mm -hmm. including our clients in the process. So we actually co-designed this three ways. It wasn't yeah. us bringing information and then giving it to the client. It was actually taking a partly finished infographic to the client and saying, what do you think? Yeah, um, because they were funding this, we were actually able to include them in that process. And I think we ended up therefore with a, with a better end product that better served their needs rather than just only expressed what we thought was important. And not all projects will work on that basis, but some of them definitely mm. will. Um, a, a, as a sort of co-design process. So just a, a, another dimension that might be useful. Absolutely. And that is really the gold standard project where we can actually include the people who will be reading and using the document in the creation process. Um, and, you know, perhaps, for example, working with the project with Public Health England, and we're developing a report for health professionals. So as part of the process, they were actually able to invite two health professionals on our calls to give live feedback on the tool we're producing and that helps tremendously because it just maximizes the chances of that tool actually being used in the real world and we're not creating these hypotheses or assumptions about what people want or what information they need so that is always extremely helpful so that's it thank you that's it for me thank you for joining us today i will um as i said give um give the, the microphone to andy to end but thank you all and i hope you uh, you stay in touch